Welcome everybody out there. I um, hope everyone is, everyone is well. Today we would like to uh, talk about a topic which is um, always a very fearsome topic with regard to, to German fund managers. This is the regulation of, of private investment funds in the, in the United States. And whenever I talk to, to German clients who would like to do a fund offering in the US or would like to talk to investors in in the US, uh, and we, we are always uh, very fearsome and we, we have a lot of, lot of respect um, with regard to US securities regulations, US fund managers regulations, and no one would like to make a mistake. We all, almost always see themselves uh, handcuffed um, um, as soon as they land uh, on the next time in the US at JFK. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad that we this time have the opportunity to to talk about the uh, regulations of U.S. Uh, uh, securities offerings uh, in the U.S. and of the U.S. regulations of fund managers in the U.S. And I'm very glad um, that uh, we've got this afternoon um, two experts from from Boskawa, one is Howard Paper, who is a partner and the co-head of Boskawa's uh, private investment fund group, and the other is Ryan Carpenter, who is an associate at, uh, at uh, um, Boskawa's investment fund group, and I'm very glad that we have the opportunity. That we very thankful that we have to, that we uh, joined us this afternoon. And I um, would like to hand over now to Howard to give you the, the short introduction of the presentation we would like to make this afternoon. Please, Howard. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, welcome everybody, and thanks to the entire uh, Polat team for inviting Ryan and I to give this presentation. Uh, what we're going to do uh, is really give a, an overview of the various uh, U.S. securities laws uh, that managers of private investment funds, uh, particularly or including managers outside the U.S., need to uh, comply with. So um, first, we'll start with the Securities Act of 1933, which is the act that governs the issuance of securities in the U.S. and interest in private investment funds are securities. Um, then we'll get into the Investment Company Act of 1940, which is the act that actually regulates, as you would expect, investment companies uh, or mutual fund types. And then uh, the third uh, act we'll deal with is the Investment Advisors Act of 1940, and that deals with uh, regulating investment advisors, uh, including advisors to private investment funds. And uh, we have some uh, short slides at the end to talk about some specific U.S. issues involving placement agents. Uh, and, and ERISA and any of the other regulatory matters. Um, so with that, we'll start off the presentation with the Securities Act, and I'll pass it over to Ryan for that portion. Great. Thanks, Howard. So as Howard mentioned, um, in the U.S., securities sold to the public um, or in general are subject to registration under the Securities Act of 1933. Uh, the, the general purpose of this requirement is to to ensure consistent and adequate disclosure of information um, necessary for investors to make an informed decision regarding the purchase and sale of, of securities. Um, the definition of security is very broad under US law, and, and it does encompass private fund interests. So as a result, unless an exemption applies, private fund offerings would be subject to registration requirements. However, you know, because the operation of private funds is generally not compatible with the regime established for publicly offered securities, and because registration is very costly and burdensome on an ongoing basis, private fund managers seek to offer interest in their funds in a valid private placement offering uh, that meet, you know, where the investors, the participants in the fund, meet certain suitability requirements. This avoids any regulatory approval or registration requirements. So, so as I mentioned, you know, the general overarching rule here is security offerings must be registered exempt. With respect to private fund offerings, there are three principal exemptions that, that we look to in, in the, the private fund industry. Um, Section 4A2 of the Securities Act, Regulation D, and Regulation S. Section 4A2 exempts transactions not involving a public offering. Uh, the SEC has released a, a good amount of guidance about what a public offering um, 
is, and there are a number of factors to be considered in determining whether a public offering is involved, including investor sophistication, number of investors, um, whether there's been any general solicitation or advertisement, um, information requirements, so forth. Um, however, because there's still some ambiguity in interpreting how those different factors might weigh into each fact-specific securities offering, the, the SEC adopted Regulation D as a safe harbor um, exemption for domestic U.S. offers and sales. Uh, lastly, Regulation S applies to offshore transactions, and you know, th this is really, it's, it's not so much an exemption as it is, it defines what is sufficiently removed from the U.S. so as to be essentially outside the scope of the Securities Act. Uh, digging a little deeper into to Regulation D, there, there are two rules under Regulation D that provide safe harbors um, for offering of, of private fund interests. Rule 506B is limited to accredited investors and does not allow for, prohibits general solicitation. Um, we can pause on each of those. Um, uh, with respect to accredited investors, the definition for individual people are uh, those that have a net worth in excess of 1 million US dollars or have income of either $200,000 annually on an individual basis or 300,000 jointly with their spouse in the prior two years with a reasonable expectation to meet that threshold in the current year. Um, for entity investors such as partnerships, LLCs, corporations, so forth, uh, generally it's a $5 million dollar. Um, threshold to, to meet the accredited investor um, standard. Uh, with, with respect to general solicitation, um, really, it, this is again, a, it can be a tricky facts and circumstances analysis, but they're really the rule of thumb is no public statements in any medium should be made referring to the offering, um, either sort of specifically or to the fact that the fund is, that the fund manager is, is um, in the market generally. Uh, Ryan, Ryan, can I can I jump in with regard to the to the general solicitation requirement? Um, the, how is this how is this would this be considered general solicitation if a, if a German fund manager, for instance, calls up a, a German a U.S. investor uh, and trying to to get him the, the U.S. investor interested? Would this already be general solicitation, or would this not be called by this prohibition? Right. So so technically, no. You know, cold calling um, is not not permitted under the general solicitation rules. Um, uh, the fund manager needs to have a pre-existing and substantive relationship um, to be in a position to assess whether the investment is suitable for the investor. Uh, pre-existing, the first part of that test just means that the issuer has a relationship with that potential client that exists prior to the commencement of the security offering, and substantive goes to the point that they're, they know enough about that potential investor that they're able to evaluate um, the, the sophistication and circumstances of that investor that they, they know or have a reasonable basis to believe that the fund is a suitable investment for that investor. Okay, okay. Let, let's make another example. Uh, maybe let's, let's imagine uh, the German fund manager has met um, a US investor maybe in London or in Berlin at a super return, we talked a little bit at a, maybe a cocktail or two together and then said goodbye and uh, half, half a year later or maybe a year later, um, the German fund manager starts a um, securities offering and then gives the, gives this, this, this guy a call again. Would this, would this, would this suffice for a pre-existing relationship? Or yes, or? Uh, so there is no time period requirement. Um, mm -hmm. So, so it could technically, again, this is going to be a, a, a facts and circumstances type analysis, and it will depend case by case. Um, but in, in that in that specific circumstance where you have uh, sophisticated institutional investors um, attending a conference, you know, att attending a conference with fund managers, um, mm -hmm. you know, that that is a foundation. It would be a good fact toward that analysis. Okay. Okay, thanks.
Um, and, and so the second rule is, is 506C here. And, and to, this differs from 506B in, in that general solicitation would be permitted, provided that the, the fund manager does have to take reasonable steps to verify um, accredited investor status. And this is utilized with you know, far lower frequency than, than rule uh, 506B, which accounts for um, more than 95% of the private placement offering market in the US. Um, whereas 506C accounts for something like 2% um, annually. Um, do I, why do you know why, why this is the case, why this is lesser utilized than rule 506B? I mean, 506, rule 506C seems to be more easy than, than 506B. Right. Well, so part of it is tied to the fact that 506C is a, is a newer rule. Um, and there's a, there's a certain amount of uncertainty that's still associated with conducting a 506C offering in the US. And that, that's both legal and commercial. Uh, there's legal concerns that the SEC would, would put a particular level of scrutiny on whether the reasonable steps had been conducted. Mm -hmm. It would essentially look a lot more closely at offerings conducted under 506C. There's also a commercial concern that given that the, the, the way that the private equity industry has, has operated for a long time, it's very relationship driven. And I, I think funds typically want to uh, show that they can raise a fund the way that their peers do based on their relationship mm -hmm. and without relying on, uh, on general advertisement. Yeah, understood. Okay. Lastly, just to note, um, on, reg, on Reg D, um, issuers are subject to disqualification in the sense that they can't rely on the safe harbor if there are certain bad acts um, that, that the issuer or its affiliates have been found um, to have been associated with convict, any sort of regulatory order, um, so forth. So mechanically, the way that um, the, the Form D, I'm sorry, that the, the Reg D safe harbor works is that issuers um, need to file Form D with the SEC as a notice of the exempt offering under Rule 506. So Form D is relatively straightforward. It's, it's only a few pages long, less than 10 pages, contains basic information concerning the issuer and the offering, contact information, related persons, the size of the offering, um, and it must be filed within 15 days after the date of first sale. The SEC defines the date of first sale as the date on which the first investor is irrevocably committed to invest. Um, that obviously has some gray area depending on how the contracts are written, the subscription agreement uh, in particular. And but what, what we've seen as sort of common market practice in the US is that um, managers take the position that the first sale is actually the date upon which the first investor is, is accepted to the fund, the first closing date, essentially. Um, the Form D can be, alternatively, it can be pre-filed, which allows managers to not disclose certain information that they would if they post-file, for example, how much has been sold or how many investors have been admitted to date. Um, it is a public filing and it becomes publicly available immediately upon filing. And there are certain amendment requirements, um, notably that uh, an annually in the event the offering is ongoing and as soon as practicable in the event of any material changes to the, to the contents of the form. Okay. Uh, just here, Ryan, just one, one question on the form defiling and the, the action that triggers the, the, the form defiling. This is in our, my understanding, it's, it's the date of first sale is the trigger point for the form defiling. And I'm, I'm curious, um, the, does this mean that um, prior to the state of first sale, you technically do not have any, any regulations of, of, of the offering um, in, in the US? Um, 
just uh, to give a little bit of background where, where I'm coming from. Uh, in Europe and also, of course, also in Germany, uh, there's a lot of headache going on uh, with regard to the regulation of, of pre-marketing, which is basically the regulation of, of marketing activities which do not yet amount to, a, to, a, to an offering. And, and in each of the European countries, it is a little bit different, uh, regulated, differently regulated the pre-marketing activities. Mm-hmm. And, and starting next year, um, there will be an, a European-wide uh, regulations of pre-marketing, which, which, um, which requires, for instance, the German fund managers to, to notify the German regulatory authority, BaFin, with regard to the start of a pre-marketing in country X or in country Z. And it also requires a little bit, a couple of pre-marketing disclaimers on the fund document. So it's a little bit, it's a, it's a kind of a regulated area, even to go into uh, activity which do not yet define an offering. Is there some, something similar in the U.S., um, some pre-marketing regulations, or is it basically kind of you know, the decisive point which just remains the date of first sale? Yeah, there are no pre-marketing type rules um, other than you know, the, the ones that we've touched upon previously, which really relate mostly to general solicitation. So, you know, assuming that a manager is is reaching out to investors where it has a substantive pre-existing relationship and intends to rely on Rule 506, um, there there wouldn't be any any pre-marketing filing or notification obligations. Okay. So um, moving on, just a quick note on on Blue Sky. Um, e- each state of the U.S. has its own set of securities regulations that arose piecemeal um, a long, long, long time ago. <laughs> And it, the National Securities Markets Improvement Act um, basically says that federal law preempts the blue sky laws with respect to offerings that rely on Rule 506. So it, with respect to offerings that are using 506 and Reg D safe harbor, um, state filings are relatively simple and usually just consist of a notice filing where they would provide a copy of their federally filed Form D and pay a filing fee. Um, there are some exemptions at the state level for institutional investors. And uh, the last thing I would note is that, you know, to the extent a, a fund manager intends to offer in the United States on a more limited basis and doesn't want to or chooses not to use Rule 506, there may be specific pre-filing or from sort of pre-offering obligations in some states. And you would want to conduct a state-by-state analysis depending on where the target offerees are. I think with that, we move on to the Investment Company Act. Yep, thanks, Ryan. Just on that last point, to make it clear to the folks who may be a little confused on the, you know, each of our states does have their own securities laws, but, but you know, by and large, if uh, you're doing an offering in the U.S., you know, the, the way that it's typically done using Rule 506, you won't have to worry about the state securities laws until after you close. And even then, only a few states will have sort of post-close filings. If you're actually not using 506, you're one of the few that are using a different exemption or, or no exemption at all, just using Section 482 of the Securities Act and relying on sort of the no public offering, uh, then you do have to do a state-by-state analysis, and then there would be some state filings. But that's one of the reasons why mm-hmm. very few people actually do that. Okay. So, um, and on to the Investment Company Act, which is an entirely different act um, than what Ryan was talking about. So, so this act is not about issuing securities. It's, 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 a, it's about governing investment companies, uh, as the name suggests. Mm-hmm. So, th- this is the act that sort of governs in the United States mutual funds. Um, and the trick with this act, the same as the Securities Act, you either need to be registered, which no private investment fund is going to want to do because the same owner's burdens under the Securities Act. So uh, you need to find an exemption as a private investment fund, uh, exe- an exemption to register in, under the Investment Company Act. So the uh, really there's one exemption in the U.S. that is used um, a significant percentage of the time, and that's what's called the Section 3C7 exemption. And we'll get into what that means in a minute. And the other exemption, which quite honestly is more complicated, 
uh, in its application and is older is a is sort of three C section three C one exemption. So we'll start with uh, we'll start with section three C one the the older exemption, um, and we call that sort of the hundred person fund or hundred person test or hundred beneficial owner test. So, um, but by and large, uh, you know, for a three C one exemption, the fund cannot have greater than a hundred beneficial owners. As a side note, the fund also cannot engage in any public offering or general solicitation, but we've already talked about that in connection with the Securities Act, same, same rules govern that uh, here. So the trick with Section 3C1 funds is it's not so easy always to count to 100. There are complex rules about when you have to look through uh, an investor uh, to see if their underlying investors have to count for the purposes of the 100 beneficial owner test. So as a, as a general matter, and again, these can get complicated, um, for a 3C1 fund, for, for any investor that is over 10% of the fund, that itself is an investment fund, it, you need to look through that entity and count its investors. And for any investor mm -hmm. into a 3C1 fund that is formed for the specific purpose of investing in that 3C1 fund or recapitalized or is a deal by deal situation where each of the underlying investors can choose to go into the fund or not, for any anything that looks like it's a way for an individual to make a decision to go into an underlying fund, whether it's directly or indirectly, that entity is going to be looked through and its individual investors are going to be counted for purposes of Section 3C1 and the 100 person limit. Mm -hmm. So now we can move on to Section 3C7, which is, which is actually quite uh, much easier to administer. And, and again, this is the exemption that most funds use. Um, I think it was first introduced in 1996, maybe, or seven. Um, so, and that exemption, we call it the sort of qualified purchaser exemption. Uh, again, no, no, no public offering, no general solicitation, same, same rules there. But here, um, you have an unlimited number of investors, so you don't have to worry about the number of investors. What you do need to worry about is that every investor in the fund satisfies the qualified purchaser test at the time they make their investment decision. For individuals, that's $5 million or more in investments, and for entities, that's $25 million or more in investments. So any institutional investor or family office or high net worth uh, will meet this, typically meet this test. Um, it's important to note that, you know, the, these exemptions on the Investment Company Act are, are, you know, what we'll say self-executing. There's no, there's no filings required to um, you know, tell the SEC that you, you know, you've now raised a 3C1 or a 3C7 fund, but they are reported, and we'll talk about the Investment Advisors Act in a few minutes, under Advisors Act SEC forms. A couple sort of a couple side notes on the Investment Company Act. Uh, uh, so, about, I'll, I'll just so, so if I interrupt you. Just just maybe can we can we go back to the to the to the previous uh, slide slide piece? Um, I've got a question with regard to the to the qualified purchaser status, um, and also with regard to the accredited investor status. We often have sometimes the, the issue if you have a German fund of fund or a German feeder fund. Um, who is going to invest into a U.S. fund, and then we all, we all have to go through these kind of complicated subscription doc documents where, where they are asked about their qualified purchaser status as well as accredited investor status. And then the question often comes up for the for the German fund manager um, whether the whether the German fund manager has to look through to to the, through the German fund and also has to qualify its investors under the qualified purchaser status and accredited investor status. Is this the case that you have to do such a look through to the to the German investors with regard to the qualified purchaser status and to credit investor status? Yeah, it's a very it's a very good question, and it's a, it's actually a fairly complicated question. So I'll keep it at a high level. Um, in any situation, if the German fund that you're talking about is is sort of a feeder fund that was set up just for the purpose of investing in the underlying U.S. Mm -hmm. fund, you would have to look through it. And you'd have oh, to look okay. through it for the accredited investor test, and you'd have to look through it for the qualified purchaser test. 
and you'd have to look through it for the 3C1 count if it was formed mm-hmm. for the purpose of making the investment in the U.S. fund. If it's mm-hmm. a typical German fund of funds that, that is doing investing, you know, at a diverse level and, and is only this one U.S. fund is, is, is not its only investment or not substantially – all, you know, it's not effectively there's a 40% sort of threshold. So as long as the German fund of funds is not putting over 40% of its assets in the U.S. fund, then it typically won't be a look-through entity mm. unless if we're looking at a 3C1 fund, a 100-person count, if it's mm-hmm. over 10% of that fund, then you are going to have to look through it and start counting all of the investors in the German feeder fund. Now, that's Mm -hmm. part of the reason why most managers don't use Section 3C1 anymore, because there's very complex Mm -hmm. accounting rules. And as you point out, if I'm representing a U.S. manager and there's a German fund of funds coming into their fund, and I ask that German fund of funds how many beneficial owners it has, the answer might be, I have no idea, because you might not have Mm -hmm. any reason to know that. So it can get complex. Um, Again, the good news is, if we're really dealing with Section 3C7 and the qualified purchaser rules, um, then the only look through the only look through is if the entity is formed for the purpose of making the investment, in which case all of the underlying investors in the German fund would have to be qualified purchasers as well. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yep. So flipping to the next flipping to the next slide, a couple of small nuances just so folks should be aware. Um, there are some exceptions to the qualified purchaser rule and some exceptions to the counting of 100 beneficial owners. So for, for so-called knowledgeable employees, which the, the definition of that is a little bit narrower than you would expect, but for, for the purposes of brevity here, a sophisticated executive officer types uh, who work at a firm and participate in investment activities, if they invest in the fund, they don't have to be qualified purchasers. And if they invest in a 3C1 fund, they don't count for the 100-person beneficial ownership test. So again, certain knowledgeable employees of the issuer are exempt. Um, and then there's a, is some case law surrounding integration rules. Um, you know, some people out there might say, well, if I have over 100 investors, why can't I just do two parallel funds that are 3C1 funds? Mm-hmm. And, the ans- and the answer is that the SEC and the U.S. rules are smarter than that. So um, if you are setting up two 3C1 funds solely for the purpose of avoiding the 100-person count, they will be integrated for the purposes of the rules and that won't work. However, if you're setting up two 3C1 funds for a different reason, whether that be tax or whether they don't have the same investment mandate, then you can have side-by-side 3C1 funds and they won't be integrated, but it's a facts and circumstances test and there has to be a separate reason for setting up the entities as parallel funds as opposed to just avoiding the 100-person test. And the the other thing important to note, and this has been used or at least used to be used more, um, if you're setting up a 3C7 fund for only qualified purchasers, and as it turns out, you have a few investors that can't meet the test, you can have parallel 3C7 and 3C1 funds. So the 3C7 mm-hmm. fund takes only qualified purchasers, and your 3C1 fund takes only your investors that aren't qualified purchasers, and they won't be integrated for the Securities Act purposes. The problem with that is you usually wind up with a very small 3C1 fund because it's your smaller investors all of the larger ones qualify as qualified purchasers. And most managers really don't want to bother with having a sort of separate fund only for a very small number of uh, smaller investors. Right, right. The one, so place we, yeah, the one place we do see that with some frequency still is when a manager will have its 3C7 institutional fund, and then it will set up a parallel 3C1 fund for friends and family, essentially, portfolio company executives, things of that nature. And we still see that with some frequency. That's exactly right. Okay, so next we're going to flip into the regulation of private fund managers. So remember, first we talked about the issuance of securities or LP interest in the U.S. Then we talked about the regulation of investment companies in the U.S. And now we're flipping into the regulation of investment advisors or fund managers under the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. Um, these rules we're about to talk about are relatively new. They were all implemented in accordance with the, the Dodd-Frank legislation uh, in the U.S., which was, I don't know, seven or eight years ago now. Um, and, I mean, the Investment Advisors Act is not new, but the rules for private fund managers are, are relatively new. 
So effectively, and uh, the definition of an investment advisor, and this is important, is anybody who engages in the business of advising others as to the value of securities or as to the advisability of investing in purchasing or selling securities, or who as, a part, as part of a regular business issues or promulgates analysis or reports concerning securities. So th that's what an investment advisor is in the U.S. Um, and again, like the other two in, uh, securities acts we talked about, unless a valid exemption applies uh, as an investment advisor, uh, you are subject to registration uh, with the U.S. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. The good news is, um, flipping the slide, Dodd-Frank gave us a number of exemptions for private fund managers. Um, I will tell you that um, any private investment fund manager cutting to the chase with a place of business in the U.S. Um, that manages over 150 assets, under, has an, under over 150 assets, 150 million assets under management from the U.S. is going to wind up having to register with the SEC unless another exemption like the venture capital exemption applies. But that was a lot there, so let's, let's break that down a little bit. So the first exemption um, that's important for a lot of the people that are listening is the foreign private advisor exemption. Now, this exemption is effectively nirvana because it means you don't have to actually do anything with the SEC if you comply with this exemption. The problem is it's difficult to comply with this exemption if you want to have any activities in the U.S. So in order to comply, you, you first can't have a place of business in the U.S. or at least not a significant place of business in the U.S. You can't hold yourself out as an advisor in the U.S. You, you, you can't put yourself out on a website saying you manage U.S. money. Those two are not, uh, you know, those two might just be fine. The, the next two are the hard ones. Um, you can't have more than 15, or you have to have fewer than 15 U.S. clients or investors in a fund, and less than 25 million in assets under management attributable to U.S. clients and investors. So if you fit in those buckets, congratulations, you don't have to do anything with the U.S. Uh, Investment Advisors Act, but it also means you don't have a lot of U.S. Uh, money in your funds. Mm -hmm. Howard, Howard, can I can I ask a question here with regard to foreign private advisor exemption? Um, a couple of couple of months ago, we had, we had an issue with with a, with a Luxembourg random anchor structure. How does such a Luxembourg random anchor structure work? Um, you usually have a German German investment advisor, or maybe also a U.S. investment advisor, who sets up a Luxembourg fund, and then um, the the, US, the investment advisor, the German investment advisor, appoints a Luxembourg. Uh, uh, alternative investment fund manager who is fully licensed under the under the European AFMD uh, regulations, and then uses this fund manager as the manager of the Luxembourg fund and has the advantage of using the European marketing passport, so it's easier to to market the fund within the, within Europe. Um, and the structure is then, of course, the, the, the Luxembourg manager is a random manco manager, a service provider who happens to have, of course, uh, several funds managed at the same time. So let's say then, uh, then, then the, the German investment advisor is of course the sponsor of the fund uh, and then the German investor is going to advise the, the rented Menko um, on the investments and then the manager, the Luxembourg manager, the rented Menko then implements the investment decisions. And the problem is then with regard to this form of private advisor exemption, the Luxembourg rented Menko often has uh, running several funds at the same time and then let's imagine the, the, the German fund manager, German investment advisor would like to, to do an offering in the US and happens to, to talk about maybe to uh, 10 US clients with, with less than 25 million uh, in total attributed to the US clients. Um, but then the problem is that this Luxembourg rent and the Menko um, happens to have already several funds under management, which uh, uh, cross this, this, this threshold. Then the question arises: Then who is who, who can who can who is who is the who is the private who is the U.S. investment advisor in, in this case? Is it the Van Gemenko or is it the German investment advisor? Do we have a kind of view on on this this problem? Yeah, Sebastian. If I'm ever a law school professor, this is going to be the first question I have on my uh, my students' exam. Um, <laughs> you've asked. You, you've asked a very complicated question where uh, the, the U.S., as you know, the U.S. doesn't have the, the same concepts 
that you, that you're talking about with separate advisors and separate managers. So we, so we, the U.S. rules have not sort of caught up or, or recognized the kinds of arrangements that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. So what what we do have is what I mentioned before. You know, the def, you, you have to really do a close analysis of the definition of what an investment advisor is. Uh, remember, any person who, for compensation, engages in the business of advising others. Uh, with respect to the advisability of investing or purchasing or selling securities. So the first thing we have to know is whether in your, in your example, both of the entities, the rent, the, the rent and a firm and the, the, the manager are uh, fit under that. And, and when we've looked at this in the past, it, it seems as if as a conservative measure, they probably both do fit under that test. Mm. Um, so um, probably both need to be thinking about their exemption or their registration under the Investment Advisors Act, and you get into a lot of other tricky rules if they're affiliated, and perhaps they can actually take advantage of a, uh, one common registration. Um, but suffice it to say, probably in your example, both of the entities would need to be looking at their Securities Act exemptions uh, mm-hmm. if separate, or sorry, Advisors Act exemptions separate if they're unrelated, and perhaps together if they are related. But we don't have any mm-hmm. special rules regarding uh, those functions. Mm-hmm. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Howard. This, this makes it at least uh, clearer than before. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, all right, Ryan, I think I'm going to kick it over to you now to talk about the other exemptions. If you're sort of not lucky slash unlucky enough to meet the foreign private advisor test, then you'll have to find another, uh, you'll either be registered with the SEC, which we can talk about, or find another exemption from registration, which Ryan will talk about. Right. Thanks, Howard. So the, the first exemption that we'll talk about um, here will be the private fund advisor exemption. And this exemption has slightly different rules depending where the investment advisor's principal office and place of business is. If the they're basically if the main office for an investment advisor is outside of the United States, and that's the assumption we'll make for purposes of this presentation but they have a a presence in the United States, a subsidiary location, uh, this could be a good fit for an exemption. Um, The the criteria are that the advisor's only US clients can be, are are, are private funds. Um, so, So you couldn't have any SMAs or direct advisory relationships with investors in the US. And then all assets managed from the U.S. are, you know, solely attributable to those qualifying private funds and the U.S. assets, not the overall advisors' assets, but their U.S. managed assets are below the 150 million dollar threshold. Um, if if this is where that advisor ends up, you, you are what what is now called an exempt reporting advisor which means you have certain obligations with respect to filing um, abridged forms of the ADV annual filing, as well as um, a a smaller subset of responsibilities in terms of compliance under the Advisors Act that would apply to you. Mm -hmm. Ryan, let me just jump in here quickly. So so I I, I would expect that probably most of the people on the phone, um, whether you know it or not, uh, if you're you're German managers, but you have U.S. client, U.S. LPs, uh, probably are relying on this, and yep. especially if you, especially if you don't have a place of business in the U.S. This is exactly what you would rely on, because if you don't have a place of business in the U.S., then you're obviously not managing over 150 million in assets from a place of business in the U.S. So this is probably what most of you are relying on. It gets a little trickier if you have a place of business in the U.S. and if you're managing assets from the U.S. Yeah, I saw this is also on my, my, my experience that most you, you, uh, German fund managers rely on this private fund advisor exemptions and then they have to do their annual uh, form ADV uh, filing with the, with the SEC and hopefully we not forget to file it. <laughs> Correct. Okay, the, the, the next exemption we'll talk about is the VC exemption, the venture capital fund advisor exemption. Um, this exemption is only available to advisors that advise qualifying venture capital funds. Um, and, and in the context of a non-US, inv- a non-US advisor, um, all of the funds that they manage have to be VC funds. 
regardless of um, uh, the advice, the, basically the investor base. So it, it's not that only their U.S. investor funds are VC. It would have to be all of their funds. Um, and then just to talk for a few minutes about what a qualifying VC fund is, um, essentially what the manager has to represent in, in the market generally that it pr pursues a VC strategy. And then at least 80% of each fund's um, capital needs to be committed to qualifying venture capital investments. A qualifying investment is an equity security issued by a qualifying portfolio company that has been acquired directly. So in other words, the, the, we're, the fund is acquiring um, preferred, typically preferred stock on a primary basis directly from the issuer and can't, can't obtain any, can't buy securities on a secondary market, um, except on a limited basis that would fit within the 20% sort of bad bucket security that gives a little bit mm -hmm. of flexibility. Um, just to talk for a minute about what a qualifying portfolio company is, um, you know, in a way that th these, this definition is, is in a way trying to get at what a VC fund should not be. Um, it, it's not mm -hmm. trading in publicly traded securities or subsidiaries of publicly traded companies at the time of the investment. Uh, the second point here about de debt proceeds basically gets to the fact that they're not engaging in leveraged buyouts. Um, so, so a VC fund is not a hedge fund. It's, it's not a LBO fund. And it's not itself an investment fund, uh, so it's not a fund of funds. Um, in addition, uh, there's limits on borrowing. Borrowing must be short term, so no longer than 120 days, and it, it's capped at 15% of the aggregate funds capital contributions plus on call um, commitments. Lastly, there's no redemption rights. So again, this gets at um, you know the, the hedge funds are not VC funds essentially. Um, like the exempt, uh, like the private fund advisor, venture capital fund advisor are required to file with the SEC as an exempt reporting advisor, um, so that they would have the ADV obligation um, on an annual basis. But there would be no cap on the amount of assets under management. Mm. Uh, lastly. Yeah. There's a carve out for, for family offices. We don't have to get into too much detail on this one as it's probably of least relevance for our, our private fund advisor clients. Um, but yeah, well, maybe we can, we can skip this maybe quickly and also in the next slide because we are running a little bit out of, out of time. Sure. Do, uh, do you want to? Yeah, I think we can, we can skip the family office exemption. I think this is, this is not so relevant uh, okay. in for European managers. Sure. We'll just touch, how about we just touch quickly on these last two points? Yeah, I'll, I'll just take these, these quickly, and these are just things for folks to note, uh, and really it's in the slides. There are particular rules in the U.S. about using placement agents. Uh, if you engage a placement agent in the U.S., that placement agent needs to be registered. Uh, if they're not registered, then uh, they are uh, subject to discipline by the SEC. You, as the uh, person who engaged them, are subject to discipline and your investors could potentially have rescission rights, uh, which is not a place you want to be if things don't go well in your fund. So if you're engaging a placement agent in the U.S., uh, please make sure that you're uh, talking to experts about the right way to do that and making sure you're engaging people who are properly registered. Also worth noting that certain state pension plans do not permit uh, placement agents to market to them due to some uh, pay-to-play scandals years ago in the U.S. So you have to keep that in mind. And then finally, uh, we threw a slide on here on, on ERISA. There, there are other U.S. regulatory and tax issues that one must be cautious of when taking U.S. investors, ERISA, uh, particularly um, if you're taking in uh, investors who are subject to ERISA. Special rules apply. Uh, fairly easy to get around those rules as long as you could have less than 25% of your fund is uh, U.S. ERISA investors. Um, if not, there may be other exemptions. Um, but suffice it to say, uh, if you have ERISA investors in your fund, you need to be getting U.S. advice as to how to handle that. And again, other tax and regulatory issues uh, also. So um, with, with that, Sebastian, I don't know if you had other, other questions, if you want to wrap it up, but that, was, uh, that concludes our formal presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Howard and Ryan, for this very insightful and helpful um, explanation on there.
U.S. Uh, securities, this market market laws. Um, as, um, my impression, it covered all the ex aspects uh, which we usually encounter here and which we are usually curious and we are usually, at least in the past, didn't have a, any clue about, about it. And now it, it is much clearer, at least the basic points, and it's easier to handle uh, for us and uh, please questions to you and if you encounter an issue and uh, hopefully, hopefully also for, for, for the people on, on the phone listening in here. Um, it was also a helpful presentation, giving a little bit more insight in this kind of intricate and, and very difficult uh, world. So thank you very much to, to the rest, to Ryan and Howard, and, and it was very nice uh, talking to you, to having the session with you, and I hope the audience had, had the same ex uh, impression, and thank you very much. A pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.